Welcome everyone. Welcome Eve Behar. Um, thank you for joining us for the inaugural lecture of the Surface Summer School at Penn. My name is Winka de Woldam and I'm the Miller Professor and Chair of the Department of Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania Stuart Weizmann School of Design. We are in Philadelphia normally. We are currently all over the world uh, like everyone is. Um, a few weeks ago, actually only, Inspired Penn students' recent involvement in the 3D printing of close to a thousand face shields for Penn Medicine 6 hospital health system and recognizing the unique challenge faced by students seeking an internship or employment in this really difficult time. I talked to Mark Lothenberg of Surface Media and together with him we conceived a month-long challenge in which the students are uh, invited to create a COVID-19 testing structure that will enable quick and easy assembly on site. The summer school is intended to express optimism in this challenge and especially uh, the more recent challenging times uh, through the explanation or exploration of exciting new directions in manufacturing, highlighting surface belief that creative design and emerging technologies can solve the world's problems. Now, that has a whole other meaning, but we won't get into that right now. But I think that also includes um, societal ease of access, um, ways of bringing things closer to uh, everyday uh, activities and um, basically everyone in society. Um, so in this summer school we will um, in the end have a super studio. The winner of the competition will be profiled in Surface Magazine and will el be eligible for an internship with a publication at a later date. I'm also really happy to announce that there will be awards at the end of it so hopefully uh, all the students participating will really feel that they had um, an incredibly valuable experience in this month's meeting, amazing people, um, and uh, being able to work on their portfolio, but also to kind of really uh, work together on something that is super important right now at this point in time. Uh, the cornerstone of the Surface Summer School at Penn is, a, is our public lecture series with leading designers, medical professionals, and architects at the forefront of innovation. I should say that I'm also super, super grateful for all of the speakers that they have generously donated their time uh, in order to help our students. And for us personally, of course, it's absolutely fun to work with all of us as a team to on this amazing challenge. Um, tonight we have Yves Behar, after uh, Eve we'll get people like Dror, Ben Shreed, Joe Doucette, Tom Main, Mitch McEwen, Mark Miller, Susan Sellers from 2x4, Marion Weiss and others. We have a huge website, we'll post that actually in the, in the um, chat at some point. Uh, we have a list of when the lectures are and how to uh, schedule yourself into those. Tonight's lecture, going back, Yves Behar, CEO and founder of Fuse Project, the San Francisco-based design and branding firm he established in 1999. Yves is a design entrepreneur who believes that product digital and brand designs are vital components of any business. In addition to his work with Fuse Project, he is also the co-founder of a startup called August, a next generation home entry system. His other collaborations with renowned partners such as Herman Miller, GE, Puma, PayPal, SodaStream, Samsung, Isamiyaki, Prada, and many others have received international acclaim. Eve's works are included in the permanent collections of museums around the world, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York and SFMOMA. For Eve, the most important component of an object's design is ultimately how it feels in your hands. He is committed to harnessing design as a tool for social and ecological good. For example, he designed the $100 notebook computer for the One Laptop Per Child Association, which aims to manufacture 100 million computers to be distributed among the world's most disadvantaged children. This is really interesting, uh, Eve, when you did that. I was working on um, uh, pro bono on an uh, orphanage 
in Liberia, and we did everything to find you, which was impossible for some reason. But I, I don't think it, <laughs> we knew it was you. But this was an amazing collapse of facts when I read, saw that. Um, Eve is originally from Lausanne, Switzerland, and studied industrial design at the Art Center of College of Design in VV. And in 1989, he moved to California to complete his degree at the Art Center's main campus in California. He teaches at the California College of the Arts, the CCA, and ser has served as chair of their industrial design program since 2005. Please join me in welcoming Eve Behar to the Surface Summer School at Penn. Thank you for joining us, Eve. Thank you. Thank you, Winko. Um, appreciate the invitation. Um, and then thank you to UPenn Architecture. Uh, as well as Surface Magazine, I think um, doing this, especially in this time, coming together, discussing um, design architecture um, that is aimed towards uh, people who need it the most, I think is, is um, uh, very important. Um, I also want to extend uh, a bit of um, uh, my, uh, my, you know, my, my, uh, my wishes to all these students who have, uh, been separated from school and have been separated from their schoolmates and from the facilities where you build things and make things. And, um, you know, I remember being at Art Center and uh, a little secret that I don't think I've told many people is um, we would break into the school in order to go back to work <laughs> on projects. So I can imagine, um, uh, you know, late at night, uh, I can imagine how challenging it's probably been for the students um, at UPenn um, to uh, the, last, the last few months. But um, I also think that um, doing, doing this work, this important work during the summer is, um, is a great initiative. So um, I wanna support that as much uh, as, much as possible. Um, so I'll, I'll share a few things. I, you know, I think the, the, one of the best qualities of design and designers uh, besides uh, being humanistic, besides you know thinking about um, you know the, what what people need, what humans need, um, and and being generous in the sense that we study, we look for insights, we look for research, we look to learn, uh, and then deliver something um, against those needs. Um, I think another quality is our our reactivity. Uh, the ability that we have to uh, look at problems, see what's happening out in the world, and um, contribute uh, with our own tools, with our creativity, with um, uh, our learned skills. Um, and I think that's a very good quality and a very important one. You know, earlier in this crisis, um, during, um, during the COVID uh, uh, work from home and lockdowns, um, I had a few days where I felt very, um, uh, very much out of it, out of the action. Uh, and, you know, I felt like I was being idle. You know, I, I was, of course, helping to solve the problems around the office, but I felt um, that um, I could, you know, I could do more and it was a bit frustrating. And then we started to work on a number of different projects. Um, um, some uh, information campaign with a brand team at Fuse Project, some um, um, industrial design with uh, uh, Mass General, Massachusetts uh, General Hospital, and we just presented a, uh, uh, a different approach, a new approach for a quickly built uh, open source uh, ventilator. And as soon as I started working on these things, I felt so energized being able to contribute, to give, to apply your skills, uh, felt so uplifting within, you know, within all that uh, sadness and all that uh, shock uh, of, uh, of everything that was happening, you know, around us at the time. Um, and so I feel these types of initiatives uh, really allow, you know, to, to lift your spirits, to lift your, um, um, uh, to, to feel like you are um, supporting and contributing important causes. And so I'll walk through a few of those projects and a little bit some of the different elements 
some of the process of how we got there. Um, they're quite different from one another, um, but I think they're all relevant. Uh, there's all they're, they're relevant elements for the assignment that you have this summer. Um, and by the way, I really look forward to seeing the work. Um, I think we will be doing that, um, you know, a little bit later, I'm guessing during the summer. So I'm going to share my screen and I'll go through some, some things and um, um, uh, go through the, here, let me give uh, the share, Start share, there we go. Okay, do you see, um, do you see the, the black screen there? Yep, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so Surface Summer School um, in collaboration with UPenn and Surface Magazine. So the first set of projects um, that I'll show you is a number of projects I'm working on right now on prefabs. Um, and I think prefabrication is very important for the subject at hand, what you'll be working on this summer. Uh, and there are many reasons why uh, prefab, I think, is um, such a great solution and a different way to approach architecture and environments. Um, the, the construction industry's sort of environmental impact is, um, is massive. The energy use, the CO2 emissions um, are uh, very much at the, uh, at the very top of any industry. And the, the needs that um, the global climate ambition set forth by the Paris Agreement um, actually uh, require reducing um, construction emissions by 30%. Um, and so that's, a, that's obviously quite, um, quite a lot. Um, and the other thing I was, uh, I've lived in California for now 25 years, and uh, something that I've never been able to address is the lack of density. Uh, the pop population densities in uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles are really low. But if you compare that to uh, Paris or London or Berlin, that density greatly increases. And that low density has really led to um, uh, sprawling neighborhoods, sprawling cities uh, and suburbia. Um, and um, and created the, the, the pricing issue that we have, uh, the high prices for housing all over California. Um, and so one, one change that was made um, in Sacramento where the capital of, um, of uh, California is, is to promote and to support ADUs. Um, and ADUs are essentially small prefab buildings that anybody can build in their backyard um, and it allows you to house a family member, aging parents, um, um, uh, students coming back from college, uh, or simply have uh, roommates and, um, uh, and a rental there. And uh, simply by adding one single unit in um, every single homes, um, you are doubling the amount of uh, people that can live uh, within within uh, within um, within that that area, and so that could make a very you know big difference. Uh, and seeing ADUs supported by a law, uh, ADU stands for accessory dwelling units. Um, uh, some people refer to them as granny flats. Um, and uh, by 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 passing a law, um, we have seen the the the, uh, the permitting for these types of units. Uh, go up 10x in Los Angeles and San Francisco, for example. Um, so it's a it's a great um, opportunity um, to to start to look at the the housing shortage and the housing problem. And um, why why ADUs and prefab? Because the standard construction creates 8,000 pounds of waste, um, and prefab is actually. Um, uh, about 10 times less than that. Uh, bringing materials to a job site, cutting them on site. Um, you can see on the left there, you know, the, the noise pollution, the waste, the uh, dust. Um, 
you know, all of that is environmentally, you know, problematic, it also drives your neighbors crazy. Um, you know, projects go on for two, three, four years plus. Um, and so imagine, imagine, imagine telling your, um, you know, your neighbors that, oh, you know, we, we were building a, an extra building in the backyard, but um, it will take one day, 24 hours to install. Um, you know, the disruption will be, you know, a few days rather than months and years. I think it creates a completely different uh, uh, opportunity um, and uh, way to build um, uh, without disrupting entire neighborhoods. Um, so the efficiency of, um, of um, prefabs is enormous. And I partnered with Plant Prefab um, about two years ago, and we presented the first uh, system, which is based on a four foot grid. And every four foot, a different type of panel can be applied, uh, whether it's a full height glass, half height, clear story, um, or a simple uh, or, or a material. And the reason why this is important is because backyards are um, tend to be very uh, uh, complex with shade from big trees and other buildings. So finding the light is, an, is, is important. So um, you can see the top area of the building is a clear story. So letting light up from the top of the building is important. Um, but there's also privacy issues. You have fences, you have neighbors. Um, and so you want to carefully uh, place windows, opening entrances in different spots. So giving that flexibility, you know, rather than building one iconic um, prefab building, um, I really felt it was much more important as a designer to create a system that really allows different people um, uh, um, to, to build their own version of it. Um, this is a 650 square foot version, but they can go all the way to 250 square feet and up to um, usually the ADU laws are around 1100 square feet for uh, maximum size. Um, so this is a this is a rendering of uh, one of them. We have a few that are being that are in construction right now. Um, um, uh, louver panels we're still working on, uh, which allow for um, for creating shade and privacy uh, at any time. Now you know variety of materials is important as well as variety of roof lines because it has to adapt to different climate, different neighborhood styles. Um, the pitch roof works really well up in Tahoe, where we're looking at some developments there too. Um, and obviously flat roofs are great for positioning solar panels um, and, um, and uh, creating a, a, a heat, a gener a heat and uh, electrical generation. Um, so here's a rendering of, um, of the two-story versions. These have a loft area on top. Um, it's um, again the construction system was about creating a seamlessness around the perimeter and then having the steel structure on the inside so it lets the surface on the outer side um, be uh, unbroken I would say by structure um, and, and mostly be panels or um, or, um, uh, or or windows. Uh, this is another one um, which we place in the Palm Springs desert, which shows actually uh, uh, concrete uh, panels, concrete paneling. Um, another project that is, I think, uh, could be influential for, for the work that you'll be doing this summer is called Ori. Ori is a startup. It's actually, it was a thesis project by students at MIT. Um, and it's a, it, it really addresses um, a very interesting issue, which um, is living conditions really in uh, smaller apartments. So the good news is apartments are getting smaller in size, which then makes them more cost, uh, more, more affordable, more cost efficient and affordable. But it also, um, there's more micro unit uh, buildings being built everywhere. And um, you know that's great when you uh, are moving to a city and and to house more people in cities. Um, it's a it's a micro apartments and micro units are um, are a solution that's um, that's starting to be um, uh, viable and seen more more and more around cities in the U.S. and uh, England and other places. 
But the problem with um, uh, with uh, micro units is the fact that they're hardly livable. Uh, 300 square foot, 250, 300, 400 square feet means that your bed is right next to the kitchen. Um, you don't really have a living room. Um, it's, um, you know, while their solution based on size, um, they're not very well thought out based on human needs um, um, and human needs throughout the day in particular. So what we built with uh, Ori uh, is this concept of robotic furniture, furniture that uh, moves around and adapts um, uh, throughout the day. One of the big issues with um, with uh, these micro apartments is they don't have much of a closet. So here on the left side of this animation, there's closets, there's a desk if you're working from home. And then when it opens up, it hides the bed. My favorite feature is, you know, the bed going away, um, um, being automatically made in a sense. Um, when it moves out of the way, it opens up um, uh, the living room in a, a area and an area to eat and entertain. This is another um, animation that we did as well here. Um, it shows, again, a realistic uh, apartment. This is the closet on the right-hand side, the bed. Um, so making, making, the, making the furniture robotic has uh, distinct advantages because it really allows it it feels almost superhuman for when when one touches um the um um the ori uh, control panel um it all sort of moves out of out of the way um here again this is a video uh, in an actual unit um and you can see you know how somebody manipulates it and changes it um you know for their you know for their needs um Again, the, the sort of closet part as well as, well as the entertainment part, um, the fact that you can um, have it move based on an app or Alexa. And of course, there's some other fun features there. <clears throat> so, you know, my, thing, my, my thoughts there are that uh, robotic furniture um, ways for um, things to deploy, to adapt, to open up, uh, to close back down, to clean themselves up uh, automatically could be uh, critical for the project at hand that you'll be working on. Um, the other, an another interesting um, architecture and environmental uh, project that we've done is we've collaborated with New Story um, and we've worked with New Story, which is a nonprofit um, here in San Francisco on the world's first 3D printed community. And um, what's really interesting for me about 3D printing, it's been part of the design industry, it's been part of my work since uh, the mid 90s. Um, and um, later it got adopted, uh, it was adopted widely in industrial design and, and later in architecture and other practices. Um, now this is supercharged because it's a very large machine um, it builds uh, these bands of concrete and, um, and, you know, usually new technologies, advanced technologies are reserved for, you know, high-end houses, uh, ex expensive products. Um, but in this case, I was particularly excited about it because the highest end technology made sense for the development world, both from a cost standpoint as well as uh, from a from a speed of um, uh, speed of construction um, and adaptability to different uh, to different places, um, I think when when we start on a project like this, one element that is common for us is a heavy dose of research and community involvement. Um, so this project, this first three uh, D printed community is in a um, in a community in uh, Mexico. Um, um, and what's what's interesting is when we started visiting different sites and different communities, um, the, the the variance of sort of the cultural needs as well as 
um, the environmental needs, the climate needs for each building um, was quite different. Um, if you if you drive um, two three hundred miles south, people are cooking outside, and then you go up north, and people want a kitchen indoors. Um, you know, and these are the uh, new story really aims at providing uh, housing for people who make two hundred dollars a month. So um, poor communities that typically live in shacks. Um, and uh, a new story's goal is to solve homelessness uh, across the world. But, you know, it, it has very different faces in different places. So uh, these rural communities, um, or I, they're not rural, they're just outside of main towns, you know, uh, uh, um, are uh, typically people don't have appropriate housing, especially for their families. And so providing them with their first house um, was, um, you know, was, was one of our, uh, is, is, is the goal and the aim um, of this project. So here, for example, you see workshops, uh, members of the New Story team and members of the Fuse Project team um, are sharing initial ideas um, with uh, printouts and with uh, 3D mockups, uh, 3D prints, and getting feedback right there on, you know, how many bedrooms do you need? Um, you know, is a bunk bed more appropriate for the children or do they need their own rooms? Or, um, you know, where is the kitchen? Um, and do you want to have a little bodega on the front of the building to, to sell? Like what, what, what became really interesting is to adapt um, um, to the specific needs of this community and obviously to other communities which um, as, you, uh, as you move to different cultures and different climates, uh, you can do very quickly with 3D printing. Um, and so, you know, one of the ex exciting parts for me of 3D printing um, these buildings is how you can adapt them to different conditions. And even within the same area, um, you could create different, um, different typologies uh, of the, of those buildings um, much more quickly uh, and then repeat them. So the goal of 3D printing is essentially this machine uh, moves from um, house site to house site and builds each of these in 24 hours. Um, this, is a, this is a rendering of um, a night view um, in, this, um, in this community. Uh, the other thing that we aim to do um, eventually in this first build, uh, we were not able to do it, but eventually is to color the concrete itself. Uh, and so creating variety and less uniformity uh, is also important. Um, so here I'm showing, um, you can see uh, the same view, that same street uh, with the um, concrete 3D uh, printer. Um, as well as some of the mock-ups for, uh, for the buildings. They're, in a, they're around 550 square feet, so pretty small because that's what the machine can do so far. This is also why it made sense to uh, pick um, communities um, um, in the developing world uh, for this. Um, these are sort of quick visualizations of uh, roof lines and uh, openings and bodega. These are uh, for ventilation. So passive ventilation is key. Um, and as I'm sure you know, uh, in different climates, different levels of ventilation, as well as um, uh, some places you can keep that open. In some other places, um, it has to be uh, more protected from, uh, from bugs and, uh, and animals. So Again, um, these are on the right hand side. Um, uh, these are the founders of New Story um, and a, a very different approach because they're building tools and technologies that not only they can use, but also any other uh, housing uh, nonprofit uh, can benefit from their, uh, from their developments. Um, this shows a rendering of the build um, by the 3D printer. The roof has to be added later. Um, and uh, this shows um, uh, some of the buildings are flipped. So again, creating variety and um, away from too much uniformity is also important. Uh, one element that I really like in, um, 
with that technology is, um, and, and, and sometimes new technologies offer that, is a new type of texture. So because, because the layers of the concrete uh, lay down uh, in succession, um, you have a bit of an irregular um, uh, wall sort of texture, linear texture. Um, it can feel a little bit adobe at times. Um, the other novel element is doing rounded corners is actually very easy. Um, and so whether it's in the shower, um, whether it's in some of the transitions or even the entry, we use rounded corners. Uh, it's easier to maintain, uh, easier to clean, and, um, and a, a new design language for, for this new technology. We also used, um, uh, here on the right-hand side in the kitchen, we also used a 3D print to create uh, some of the counters, uh, kitchen counters, sink counters, etc. cetera. Um, this shows you an interior. So the last project I'm going to share is not as much in, I mean, it's not in the environmental space, not in architecture, um, but I think it's also very indicative of um, what I call design for good, which are essentially projects that we're doing for um, nonprofits and for um, uh, with, a, with a humanistic uh, point of view. Um, so Verbien is also a Mexican um, initiative. Uh, it is probably today the most successful um, distribution of eyeglasses for children in the developing world. Um, in the last 10 years, they have distributed over 6 million eyeglasses to kids in school. And um, this was an initiative that um, became, became clear of its need 10 years ago as 10 to 11 percent of school children in Mexico uh, need eyeglasses. Uh, but most of them uh, don't have access. Um, uh, you know, to eyeglasses. So the system um, uh, see well to learn is a translation of Verbian uh, in English, um, and um, and um, the 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 system in place really didn't allow for these kids and the, um, uh, to get these eyeglasses. And and the, um, and the issue is that once they don't have eyeglasses, then they're not learning. So the Mexican government, as well as this nonprofit, it's a partnership between the two, uh, realized that providing eyeglasses to kids would make a tremendous difference in, um, in these kids learning uh, and their future. So we, um, they started um, distributing eyeglasses that were uh, that came from China that were sort of standard black frame eyeglasses. And the kids uh, didn't like them, didn't uh, wear them, uh, tended to be, um, uh, tended to feel like there was a stigma attached to wearing those dark framed eyeglasses. And so that became a real problem because um, essentially the aim was, um, you know, wasn't working if, if the kids, uh, after all this work of uh, testing every child and uh, testing their eyesight, um, ordering the glasses and delivering the glasses if they were not wearing them. So after the one laptop project, uh, the one life laptop uh, per child project, um, it became clear that design makes a difference um, for, um, for projects that essentially typically didn't have design inserted into them, didn't have design as a driver of customer satisfaction. Um, and, um, and so after seeing the one Top project, um, Verbien, the organization called us and we started uh, looking at the needs and the ideas around manufacturing eyeglasses. Um, what we were able to do was quite remarkable because we were able to integrate the manufacturing of the frames as well as the lenses within the same factory in Mexico, which was a big piece of the solution. And then we designed the eyeglasses specifically for kids' faces and especially Latin uh, kids' faces um, and um, developed also um, the manufacturing side and the material side uh, of the project. Um, and the, the big idea, which actually was to slide up, was to split the eyeglasses down the middle 
for easy assembly of the uh, of the lenses, and um, but also because it offered uh, unique uh, looks that the kids could pick. They could pick the color of the top part of the frame or the bottom part of the frame, um, and that um, give gave them a whole different um, set of choices. So the the different frame shapes are assembled with different colors on top and bottom. Um, ergonomic features such as, such as nose, um, um, nose pads uh, can be changed um, to really fit the child specifically. And uh, we also use Grillamid, which is a Swiss material that has a uh, high distortion rate. And Grillamid uh, basically made the glasses almost indestructible. Um, the, the scary picture on the right is I'm sure um, when we see that happen with kids walking, stepping, um, standing on their glasses by mistake, um, and the distortion uh, made, uh, made the glasses survive um, a kid's life, basically. So as I said, they came in many different colors, um, as well as size and shapes. And the children would order them through this catalog. They would they first get tested, and then the glasses are delivered both with the uh, uh, right lenses and their the colors that they picked. Um, all this was done for about five dollars, including the testing um, of the kits. So. Um, you know, the, 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 the notion of efficiency in design and architecture um, is something that, you know, <clears throat> is, is, is not always considered in this way. Um, when you're a nonprofit, um, let's say you have a few million dollars um, every year granted by, you know, private donors and maybe by the government. Um, and based on the price of those glasses, you essentially can distribute more of them if they're cheaper. So efficiency, um, you know, was uh, was was critical also to the success of um, those distributions. So these are some of my favorite pictures, which is um, pictures actually that I took um, uh, when I went to some of the distributions. Um, this was early on in the project, but um, what was amazing is. Um, the kids who received um, the glasses started to look at each other and start to say, look at me, I am unique, I am unique. Um, they were the only ones with that color um, and, um, and uh, that, was, that was so important to them to be able to uh, stand out or associate with other kids with the same uh, eyeglass colors. So you can see on my tray there, there's uh, many different color ones. Um, um, and uh, these are just some of the some of the kids in the classrooms there. Um, and you know, I have it's 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 really an incredible uh, result. We were actually, even though we did this project ten years ago, we've remained in touch and did um, other side projects with this um, nonprofit. And we're just on the phone with them, in fact, about a month and a half ago. And um, it looks like we will we will. Uh, come up with some new frames and some new, some new designs. So, uh, and, and the other interesting thing is for nonprofits, just for a for-profit, you know, there's two things that are important that you can measure your success by. How happy is your customer? And in this case, you know, it doesn't matter whether people paid for their eyeglasses or not. You have to deliver something that they're happy with. And how recognizable is the work? How is it promoting um, the, um, the nonprofit over time? And in this particular case, these eyeglasses are so well known in Mexico because when school children are walking down the street after school, when they get home, um, everybody notices them. The adults notices that, notice them. Um, and so it's become a, a, a very, uh, a point of pride in Mexico um, uh, because it's uh, built in Mexico for Mexican children. Uh, by really an exemplary organization. So um, creating icons that sustain and support um, uh, this nonprofit is another thing that you can do as a designer. So I'm not sure how much, uh, how far we've gone, but um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pleased that we have some time for questions.